that we would trust and that we would listen. Because you hold us not to crush us, but to protect us. You draw us close, not to rebuke us, but to correct us and set our feet on solid ground. And Lord, I pray tonight that that even as we need you, that you would speak to us. Let every person here sense the presence of your spirit. Let them hear the power of your word. And let us be changed because we've been in the presence of the living God. It's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 is where we're going to be tonight as we continue our study through the, this little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, and we call this series Impact because we're talking about how God wants to impact your life and how God wants you to impact the world with your life. And, uh, and we're going to be in chapter 2 beginning in verse 16. Hey, I'm glad you're here on this holiday weekend. You guys glad you're here? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a great weekend. We celebrate the 4th of July. If, uh, if you missed it, we had a great time at the Aquatic Center yesterday. Uh, we gathered, uh, had about 700 people there that were celebrating our, our freedom as a nation and our freedom in Christ. And I love that service because we get to share the gospel with so many people. And after the service, we uh, had a baptism. We had about four or five people who said, yeah, I want to get baptized on the 4th of July because, you know, Christ has set me free. And we ended up inviting anybody who wanted to get baptized uh, to join us, and we baptized 13 people yesterday. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. So, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great day if you missed it. I uh, hope you had a great 4th of July. But this is a weekend where we celebrate our freedom. And, and uh, we live on the, the greatest nation on the face of the earth uh, and, and perhaps the greatest element of this greatest nation is our freedom. It, it's our freedom. I, I mean, we've got guarantees for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. We used all of those yesterday, by the way. We're using them now uh, as well. Uh, you're free to be whom you choose to be, to live where you want, to pursue your dreams. And we have this freedom because uh, the founders of this nation, our ancestors, fought for it. And many of them died to gain and preserve our freedom. And, uh, and freedom, they believed, was worth the fight. You guys believe freedom is worth the fight? Yeah. Well, the fight for freedom began long before the United States became a nation. Uh, in fact, the fight uh, for freedom is a spiritual issue that has been fought over since creation. And, and uh, I hope that you know, and, and uh, if you're since you're here, you will when you leave tonight, that Jesus came to set us free. Jesus came to set us free. In fact, the Apostle Paul in his letter to Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And, and the Apostle Paul continues that passage discussing the battle uh, between the two areas that Jesus set us free from. So if you go on to read Galatians 5, you see Paul has a discussion about these two areas that plague our lives, that will enslave us and keep us from experiencing the blessings and the blessed life that God wants to give us in Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, the two areas that Paul talked about, the first one is he, that Christ came to set us free from the destructive desires of the flesh. Jesus came to set us free from the destructive desires of the flesh. You know, our bodies are tainted by sin, and so we have the sin nature inside of us that craves sin, that wants to sin, that's drawn to sin. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we fight a battle with that all the time. As followers of Christ, we're doing battle because the Spirit is in us, and we don't want to give in to the cravings of sin. And when we do, we know it's wrong because the Spirit convicts us. But we're in this place where we do battle against the flesh. Because the flesh will destroy us. The flesh will lead us to that place of addiction, of our appetites, of our habits. That will kill our lives. And so Jesus desires that you live free from those sinful habits that reap destruction in our lives. 
okay? Christ came to set us free from the destructive desires of the flesh. And if you read Galatians 5, as, as Paul talks, he's, he tells us that Christ came to set us free from the life-killing rules of religion. Um, now, this is the other extreme, because we all you know, know about this uh, whole desires of the flesh and how evil that is. But this is the other side of it. This is the extreme end of it, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, if you will. It, but it's just as destructive. It's just as imprisoning as indulging the flesh. It is legalistic religion. Now, if you read Jesus, and I encourage you to read Jesus, you know, the Gospels are there for a reason. My favorite part of the Bible, I'm just going to tell you that. And, and, uh, and Jesus continually had these conflicts with these people called the Pharisees who were the legalistic experts in the Jewish law. And, and he battled them because they represented everything about legalism and nothing about grace. And so everything that is harsh that you read in the New Testament that Jesus ever said, he spoke to these religious leaders called Pharisees who represented a legalistic approach to a relationship with God. They weren't really interested in the relationship as much as they were the rules. And the Apostle Paul battled these same people because a lot of them became followers of Jesus Christ. And then they followed the Apostle Paul around as he went and started churches and preached grace. Uh, and they poisoned the churches. And uh, the letters that he writes, the letters to the Galatians, the letter to the Colossians, uh, to the Ephesians, to the Romans, deal with these people who are trying to poison and corrupt the churches of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, uh, when you read him, you, you understand that he's, he's angry because not only are a lot of the people struggling with the desires and temptations of the flesh, but they're also struggling with this legalistic approach to faith. Now, what I found growing up in, in my experience in the church was that most churches will warn you of the destruction of the flesh. A lot. Right? You been there with me? You know, they preach against the destruction of the flesh, even if nobody there is, like, admitting that they're struggling with it. They are, but they're not admitting it. Uh, but a lot of the churches will remain silent about the dangers of religion. Hmm, wonder why. Right? Well, that's why we read the Bible. And by the way, that's why we encourage you to read the Bible. And, and in fact, if you don't have a Bible with you tonight... If you didn't bring one and you're kind of like everybody else has got a Bible or a Bible app or whatever, there are Bibles look just like this in the pew. Uh, and you can grab one and turn to page 1,253 and catch right up with us. And if you need a Bible, take it with you. If you need a Bible, we want you to take one of these with you because we want you to have the Word of God, to read the Word of God, because it's not about what the church says. It's about what God says in His Word. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. This is one of Paul's extensive rants against legalistic religion. Now, remember last week we just talked about how Christ paid for our sins on the cross. How he nailed them to the cross with him and he canceled the record of debt. Uh, and, and so Paul continues and he says, Therefore, therefore, because of Jesus, because of grace, because of forgiveness through Christ, let no one pass judgment on you in regards or questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ... You died to the elemental spirits of this world. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All right, in this extensive rant against legalistic religion, Paul exposes the failures of legalistic religion. The failures of legalistic religion. And I want to share uh, some thoughts with you out of this passage tonight 
that I think are about the failures of legalistic religion. Uh, and, and, uh, and I do so in light of this. Number one, I celebrate grace in Jesus Christ. You guys know that we talk about grace. We talk about forgiveness of sins. And, and, and I want to share this with you from several different perspectives. The, the, the message tonight is multi-level. First of all, if you're here and you're checking out Calvary or you really want to understand what we're all about, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the, the core ethics of why we do what we do. How we understand ministry, how we understand life, how we understand scripture, how we understand our relationship with God. So if you want to know who we are, this is going to be very revealing. Secondly, there's a lot of us who grew up in legalistic type churches. Okay? And, uh, and so those of us who grew up in legalistic type churches oftentimes have those voices of our childhood still echoing in our heads. Are you with me there? You've got those people who, and you don't, even, you don't remember their names, but their voices are coming down. And they're still telling you, you can't, you shouldn't, you're no good because you did this and that. And, and I'm just telling you that Satan's the one who's playing that, you know, tape in your head. Because we follow and serve the God of grace. Who through Jesus Christ has paid for all of our sins through his death and resurrection. And we walk in Christ. That was the message last week. We walk in Christ, not by legalistic religion. Uh, on the third level, this is a, a, a statement about why so many churches are struggling and failing in our country. And, and why so many individual Christians are not living in the joy and the victory that Jesus Christ wants to give us because they're leaning into or embracing legalistic religion. Looking for answers and joy in that and, and they're not going to find it. And so here's what Paul tells us and what we need to see tonight. First of all, legalistic religion fails because it doesn't change lives. It doesn't change lives. Look again at that last verse that Paul says. These, all these things he's talked about, have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value. They're in no value of setting you free and stopping the indulgence of the flesh. They're in no value of changing your life from being a prisoner of darkness and leading you into light. What Paul's saying is, look, all, you can practice all the legalism you want to. You can try to follow all the rules that you want to. It's just not going to work because Jesus changes lives. Rules don't. Jesus Christ is the one who changes us. That's why we're followers of Jesus, not followers of rules. See, and it didn't work for the, the Old Testament. Do you notice that? I mean, God gave them the Ten Commandments. He gave them the law. They couldn't follow it. They failed. That's why the animal sacrifices don't work. They failed. So God took on the form of flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven of our sins because keeping the law didn't work. Because we're so wrapped up in our sin that we can't let go of it, and we can't follow the law, so Jesus paid the price for our sins. Didn't work then, doesn't work now. And yet still many in religious authority try to legislate behavior. In other words, rules. Like somehow rules are going to change lives. And maybe you've experienced this personally, maybe you've seen it happen, maybe uh, this is new to you. But there's a lot of times when churches will try to tell people how to act rather than introduce them to the one who will change their life. Okay? I, I know the, the churches that uh, I grew up in, Southern Baptist churches, to the core, hardcore. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, Southern Baptist from birth, all right? That's just how it is. And I grew up in churches where uh, once a quarter on Sunday night, we would read the church covenant. Thankfully, they had glued it to the inside of the hymnal and not the Bible so they wouldn't have to burn them. Uh, but... Uh, and I say that, I didn't understand. I was a kid, I'm reading this thing, and it had all these different rules, these agreements on how we were going to live our lives. And, and one of them said that we agree that we are going to abstain from the sale and use of alcoholic beverages. And we read that as a congregation. We're going to do this. And, and I was a kid, and my, my parents were uh, teetotalers and, and hated alcohol because my grandfather was a raging, abusive alcoholic. And my dad hated this day, you know, so it wasn't part of our family. And so I'm like, oh, cool, everybody's, everybody's committed to this. This is so awesome. And here's what I didn't know. That because we were saying this and practicing this, that we were raising up hypocrites and Pharisees in our church. I was one of the Pharisees. We didn't use alcohol. I didn't use alcohol. I was against it. And, and you know what? Uh, 
I'm going to judge you if you do. I'm going to condemn you if you do. I was a really good Pharisee. On the other hand, we had a bunch of hypocrites in our church because everybody in leadership had agreed that they're going to live by this church covenant, which, by the way, wasn't biblical. It was extra biblical. Anytime people add stuff to the Bible, it's not a good thing. Even if they have really good intentions, it's just not a good thing. It just doesn't work. And so they raised up a bunch of hypocrites in leadership. Because they were people who were sitting there in the pews reading this statement saying we're going to abstain from the sale and use of alcohol. Only they didn't. And we wonder where the power is in the church when the church is uh, committed to raising up hypocrites and Pharisees unintentionally. See, it just didn't work in terms of what we wanted it to do. That wasn't going to change the behavior. Jesus changes the behavior, not rules. Or in my family's case, my dad, he was, he was morally opposed to lots of stuff. Uh, alcohol was one of them. Dancing was another one. He didn't want me to go to dances because when you go dancing, it leads to lust and it leads to drinking. Hey, just telling you what he told me. I wish that I'd had the courage to tell him, Dad, I don't need to dance to lust. <laughs> Two are not connected in my life. Right now. In fact, I was a really lousy dancer, but an excellent luster, okay? <laughs> Two are not necessarily connected. And so, you know, and so he's trying to, you know, prevent this stuff from happening, but it didn't, didn't really work. Because legalistic religion doesn't change lives. And you know that here at Calvary, we're committed to leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And we know that Jesus Christ will change your life if you invite him to. So legalistic religion doesn't work because it doesn't change lives. It also doesn't work because it replaces the Holy Spirit with rules. It replaces the Holy Spirit with rules. We tell people that Christ will change your life and, and that the Holy Spirit indwells them the moment they confess Jesus as Lord, that the Holy Spirit moves into their life and guarantees their salvation and is going to change them and teach them. And then we try to do the Holy Spirit's job by giving people a list of expectations. Okay, now that you trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to change you, but here's how he's going to change you. And we want you to start living up to this right now. You got to stop these behaviors. You got to start these behaviors. You got to do these things. You got to not do these things. And then you'll be a good Christian. And so we try to do the Holy Spirit's job. In other words, we try to play God. Hmm. I believe that's idolatry. And we try to play God. If we trust the Holy Spirit to change people, then we must also trust the Holy Spirit's timetable. Uh, see, that's the problem right there. See, in church, we don't just want to trust their timetable. We want the Holy Spirit to change them right now so that they look like us and act like us and only have the same sins that we have. <laughs> well, we don't say it that way, but, uh, but that's what we want. And yet, we, so, so we become impatient toward new believers. Huh. Think about this. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 4, love is patient, and the love is kind. So anytime that we are impatient, we are being unloving. Hmm. How about that? Welcome to our church. We're not going to be patient with your life change. We're going to put demands on you. We're going to be unloving toward you. And yet we want to change people by, by uh, the love of his people and the power of his truth? No. See, we're not going to change their behavior. And if they change their behavior for us and not for God, then they're hypocrites. And if they change their behavior for us and not for God, it's not going to last. We want God to change the heart so that their behavior follows. And to do that, we have to be patient. So here's how I've seen the Holy Spirit work uh, just in one area in our church. Okay, And this was a battle when we started uh, kind of taking this approach. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as Calvary, you guys know that we are pro-family. We believe that God's plan to bless is one man, one woman, one lifetime. Okay? That, that's God's plan to bless. And, and, and if you follow his plan, he's going to bless you uh, in that. We also know that we mess up God's plan, but God redeems. 
And, and so we offer that out as, as a hope that God's going to restore, He's going to redeem, He's going to build, He's going to bless. As you move your life to align with Him, He's going to bless you more and more. Well, we happen to have a lot of unmarried couples that attend Calvary. By unmarried couples, I mean, you know, those people who are living in sin. By the way, are any of you not living in sin? Because I got it at my house. And that's not just my wife that brings it there, okay? I'm just saying. So, sorry, Ralph. Uh, yeah, anyway. The... Uh, but, you know, and so we, a lot of churches would, would make people feel really uncomfortable or judge them or shun them. And, and uh, here at Calvary, we just welcome you. Okay, we just welcome people as a mess. Okay, we're, you're, you're, we don't point you out. We don't try to make you feel uncomfortable. We just welcome you. And here's what happens. Because we don't, you know, try to guilt you or shame you or do anything else, after a, a period of time, and this happens so often here, I can't even tell you how often, a, a, a couple will find one of the pastors and they'll say, hey, um, we, uh, we've been coming here for a while, and um, if you guys don't know, we're, we're living together, and sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. <laughs> sometimes we're like, you guys aren't married? Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, we know that, and this is what they say, we know what we're doing isn't pleasing to God. And we want to know if you will marry us so that we can be obedient to God. And we go, yes! We will certainly help you to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Because God is convicting you, because the Holy Spirit is leading you into this relationship of commitment that can honor God and can bless your family, we will certainly help you to do that. Now, there's a lot of churches, there's a lot of pastors I know, friends of mine, that have issues with the way that we approach this. And I go, you know what, uh, I think God rejoices in their movement towards Him and their movement of obedience a whole lot more than he does us telling people to get out because their lives are a mess. Because truthfully, our lives are a mess and we all need God. And if we're listening to him, then we're going to respond to him, and God is going to convict us, and he's going to change our hearts, and he's going to change our behaviors, and we don't have to play the Holy Spirit. We simply get to work with him to see lives redeemed. So legalistic religion doesn't work uh, also because it evaluates spiritual maturity by external conformity instead of character. hope you guys don't mind me going long tonight because I'm on a roll. Uh, you know what? Dysfunctional churches evaluate spiritual growth by external conformity. Uh, in other words, do you pretend, and I use the word pretend pretty harshly, do you pretend to conform to us so that we can consider you spiritually mature like we're spiritually mature? So do you dress appropriately? Do you wear the suit and the tie? Ladies, do you wear the dress instead of the pants or, you know, shorts, you heathens? And... and uh, and is a dress long enough, right? Because it's not just you have a dress on, but is a dress long enough? And does it cover all your shoulders? Uh, does it go down your arm far enough? Is it, you know, God forbid, any cleavage uh, would pop out? And, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Do you dress appropriately? Do you attend enough? Do you attend regularly? Do you attend Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, visitation? Uh, I'm just telling you. Hey, we don't have it, but uh, if we did, you're supposed to be there. Um, do you abstain correctly? Do you, you know, do you abstain from alcohol, do you abstain from movies, TV, gambling, dancing, whatever, fill in the blank that you're supposed to abstain from? Do you pray correctly? Do you do quiet time the right time of day? Do you witness the way that we tell you? All of these things that are so important for churches they use to evaluate someone's spiritual maturity, and they're not biblical. Jesus looks at the heart. Let me say that again. Jesus looks at your heart. God desires character. He, he's not telling us, here's the list of things that are going to make you look good. He says, I want to change your heart. And that's why the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. There's no rules when you live by the character of Christ. Because if you're living by the character of Christ, the rules are unnecessary. Because you want to honor God with your character. Here's how it has played out in my life. Because um, I was judged and pronounced spiritually immature uh, as a college student for my lack of conformity to the standards. 
Um, by the way, I was about you know, 18, 19 years old. I'd already surrendered to ministry. Uh, I was memorizing scripture. I was going to Bible college. I was uh, go- teaching Bible studies and attending Bible studies. I was serving in the inner city. Uh, I was doing all these kinds of things. And yet, and I confess this, and you guys, I, I reveal my nerddom to you. <laughs> I played Dungeons and Dragons. That's right. Some of you grew up with that game. You know that it's from hell. That's right. It's evil. People who love Jesus, they don't play Dungeons and Dragons. If you don't know what Dungeons and Dragons is, you're not a nerd. And um, just understand that all of the really cool video games that your kids play are based off of that game. And, uh, and so I, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons with my Christian nerd friends. And I was told, you can't be a Christian and play Dungeons and Dragons. And I said, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure I'm a Christian. I've confessed with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. That's what the Bible says. Oh, okay. Well, you're a Christian, but you can't be a growing Christian. You can't be a maturing Christian and play Dungeons and Dragons. And that's when God began showing me the falsehood of legalistic religion. I told you I was a Pharisee. I was a really good Pharisee. And God began to poke holes in my Pharisee bubble by putting me in the place where I was being judged for something that that God hadn't convicted me was wrong. And I was told to stop. I was rebellious enough to tell them what they could do with that. But uh, (laughs) I just want you to know here at Calvary, we look at character. We look at character. Because you can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. No matter what label you put on you. And so do you love people? And do you love God? Are you joyful and kind and patient? Do you have self-control? Are you evidencing the fruit of the Spirit in your character? If so, that's what declares you mature, not your external conformity. Legalistic religion also fails because it loves authority and disregards joy. Did you catch this in verse 18? Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions and puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head, which is Christ. Um, Asceticism, if you don't know what that is, that's just the fancy word for denying yourself any physical pleasure and abusing yourself, trying to purge yourself of your evil desires. Uh, It's oftentimes summed up by the, the picture of a guy holding a short whip and flailing himself. You know, seeing somebody do that, that's asceticism. Asceticism is also like, you know, living without any creature comforts at all. You know, like sleeping on the floor and uh, uh, living, you know, without Diet Pepsi uh, and stuff like that. (laughs) Or or ice cream. Uh, And and so, and then the visions of angels, he's, he's talking about people who think they're super spiritual because they've had really cool religious experiences. And, and some of you have had really cool religious experiences, and some of you just had normal, really cool spiritual experiences. And, uh, and, and however you encounter God, that's cool. But some people think that because they've had some kind of experience with God, that, that they're better than other people that haven't had that similar spiritual experience. In other words, you know, the holier than thou because, you know, God talked to me, not you. Uh, And so everyone who's legalistic, I'm just going to say this, loves authority, loves the power, loves the control, because they have the special experience. They get to be the one who make the rules. They get to be the ones who who share, here's what it means to be really spiritual, and the rest of you need to, like, just conform to what I say. And they derive their authority from the experiences that they say qualifies them or the education that they say qualifies them to lead other people. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus picked 12 people who didn't have any education or any experience. And then he qualified them. Isn't that interesting? See, at Calvary, we don't give people authority. If you show up here and go, okay, I've got all this education, I've got all this experience, and so you ought to give me authority to lead, we just go, ah, thanks for offering. We'll get back to you. I'm just going to tell you, we, what we look for is your life. And, and we're looking to see if you're having an influence on people, pointing them to Christ, you know, loving people, uh, being a joyful servant of Christ who, who's encouraging and who's kind and who people want to follow. In other words, we're looking to see if you're a leader. And if you're a leader, then we're going to put you in charge of people because you already are. Because you're already influencing people. 
And it's not about positional authority, and it's not about some kind of experiential authority. It is about the fact that God has ordained you, and you are using the influence he's given you to lead people to Jesus. That's what we look for. And and so we're looking for joy-filled servants who've got friends. We don't care about the other stuff. That's all nice and good and wonderful, but it's not what is important to Christ. And then finally, legalistic religion fails because it values rules over relationships. Rules over relationships. Look at this. If with Christ, verse 20, you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you're still alive in the world, you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. He says this is stuff that's going to pass away. It's not going to last. And it doesn't work. So you're going to fail as a church if you love rules more than people. You're going to fail as an influence for Christ if you love rules more than you love people. Think about this. Jesus made the rules. Right? (laughs) He's the one who gave the Ten Commandments. He's the one who said, here's what you need to do. He taught all the stuff. He's the one who made the rules. And then he went and died for us who broke the rules. What did he love more, the rules or the people? People. Yeah. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. That is so cool. And see, legalistic churches, legalistic Christians want to emphasize the rules and commands, and they often do it claiming to be biblical or just being biblical. You know what's interesting? Jesus said all the laws and all the prophets rest on these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. So at Calvary, we believe relationship precedes rebuke. We're not going to speak truth into your life unless you invite us to. By the way, showing up here for a service, you invite us to teach the word of God to you. If you hear God taking this truth and applying it to your life, then listen to him. No, I am not preaching at you. Okay, if you feel like the sermon is directed at you, That just means that you're listening to the Holy Spirit, and so you ought to listen to him. Okay? If that makes you mad, you got issues with God. Okay? Doesn't matter where you go, you're going to have issues with God. Because if he's trying to apply the truth, then that's really cool. But by attending worship, you invite us to share God's word with you, and sometimes the truth will penetrate your life and hurt. Because God wants to teach you something. And then if you ask for counsel, whether it's from a pastor or from one of our our lay uh, leaders or volunteers or whatever, then you're inviting us to apply God's word into your life. And we'll do that if you invite us to. And if you step into leadership, then you are inviting accountability for your life from everybody else in leadership here at Calvary. We actually have a leadership covenant. And and if you want to step into that place where where we recognize you as a leader, then you're accountable to us for your whole life and we're accountable to you. That's the way it works. But we begin this process by loving people. And as we develop relationships, we have the right to speak truth into their lives and offer up the counsel of wisdom so that God can bless their lives lives. So tonight, have you tasted the power of freedom? It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Jesus will change your life if you ask him to. Whether you need freedom from the flesh or whether you need freedom from religion, has Christ set you free? free. Let's pray. Father, we need you. And tonight, we pray that you would speak into our lives. And for those who need to enter into a first-time relationship with Jesus Christ, Father, I pray they would hear your voice and understand that you love them beyond their sin, and you offer forgiveness to them tonight, if they but call upon your name. And Father, for those that know you, I pray that you would visit grace and peace and truth into people's lives. Call them back from the destruction of the flesh and set them free from the destruction of religion. And let us walk in Christ, living in grace, living in the joy of a love relationship with the God who created us, the God who has redeemed us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand and worship our God together.